in uh, recent months, we've heard a lot about war and warfare uh, ever since the time of the terrorist attacks in uh, New York and Washington. Uh, we, we've been hearing all this talk about war. The president has talked about war and making war on terrorism. Uh, we've had uh, uh, a war going on in Afghanistan, and the might of the American military has been pounding away. And now uh, that that seems to be winding down, there are those who are... Uh, uh, speculating, well, where are we going to go next? What are we going to do next? And, and there is that, uh, uh, the talk of war is, is in the air. Well, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about war, a lot to say about warfare, and particularly in the context of the Christian life. And that's what I want to focus our attention on uh, here this afternoon. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, and he said, This charge I commit unto you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before on you, that you by them might war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Paul said, I'm committing a charge unto you. You have an instruction. I'm talking to you about something very important. I want you to war a good warfare. So, Timothy was being called upon to war a good warfare. Uh, back at the end of this book, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 12, the Apostle Paul makes a similar statement. He said in verse 11, 1 Timothy 6.11, But you, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, goodness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. He told Timothy, War a good warfare. He told him, fight the good fight of faith. What did Paul mean by that? Well, let's notice back a little further in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Here is Paul right at the end of his life. And he is aware by special insight that God has given him of the events that are going to transpire in the church in the years immediately after his death. And so he writes to Timothy, who's a much younger man, and he tells Timothy about some of the things that he's going to have to face and go through. And he gives him some advice. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, he said, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. They'll turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, but watch you in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. For I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Paul told Timothy, he said, you know, the time is coming when people are going to turn away from the truth. They're not going to want to hear the truth. They're going to want teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. They'll want to sort of have their, their fancy tickled, as it were. His admonition to Timothy in that context, he said, now, when that happens, he didn't say, well, change your message, uh, sort of go with the flow, be, be progressive, Timothy. Uh, you have to, you know, hold on to your audience, so if they don't believe this, well, you just sort of quit preaching about it. No, he told Timothy, he said, preach the Word. Preach the Word. Just stick to the Scriptures. Preach the Word. Just on and on. That's what you do. 
where they won't endure sound doctrine, you just keep on giving it to them. Preach the word. And then he made the statement of himself. He said, I have fought a good fight. Paul knew he was at the end of his life. He said, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. Now, he told Timothy, war a good war fight. War a good warfare. He told him, fight the good fight of faith. And then he said at the end of his life, he said, I have fought a good fight. Now, Paul is talking about warfare, and he's talking uh, about what he himself has done and what he's telling Timothy to do. Let's understand that a little more fully. What did Paul mean in all this talk about warfare? That Timothy was to war a good warfare. That he was to fight the fight of faith. That he, Paul, had already fought a good fight. Well, let's notice 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, Paul says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We walk in the flesh. We're physical human beings. Uh, we live our lives. We uh, go up and down and live in this physical world. But though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. We're not involved in the fighting and the warfare and all of the things that so characterize this world. We don't involve ourselves in carnal warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not physical. We are involved in a war. We're to war a good warfare. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The pulling down of strongholds. Now, think about it. We've all seen pictures uh, of castles back in the Middle Ages and castle-like structures that go back to antiquity. So people would build uh, a castle or a fortress for the purpose of protection. Uh, generally, they would try and position it on some uh, high mountaintop or some uh, rocky crag somewhere uh, where it would be very difficult to get to. It would be sort of inaccessible. Uh, sometimes they surrounded the castle with, with a moat, uh, a, a moat of water where uh, uh, the... Uh, be very difficult to get across. They, they would have it located up high. They would have high walls. Uh, they wanted to be strategically located where it was very difficult for someone to get to them, to overpower them. They erected these fortresses, these strongholds, for the purpose of protecting themselves. And... So they had these, these fortresses up. You remember uh, the account given in uh, Samuel and in Chronicles of when King David first became king of the entire nation of Israel. And he sought to move his capital from Hebron uh, to Jerusalem, which was known as Jebus at that time. It was a citadel uh, of the Jebusites. And it was located, uh, it was just a small portion of what is now modern day Jerusalem uh, that was that city. And it was strongly fortified. And the Jebusites taunted David and his men. They said, why the blind and the, and the halt and the lame, the crippled, can defend. Our city. We can just put them up here because you can't get in. You see, people put up strongholds with the idea to protect themselves, to keep anybody from being able to, to get in. Now, Paul talks about casting down. He talks about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not physical, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. They can pull down the fortifications that have been erected. What specifically? Casting down reasonings or imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, casting down imaginations or as it uh, could be rendered uh, casting down arguments or reasonings and pretensions that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought, every design, every strategy 
Now, let's, let's think about that a little bit. We're involved in a spiritual warfare. And we have to use spiritual weapons. And these weapons, we're told, are very effective. They're mighty through God. They're able to pull down the strongholds, the protective barriers that we have erected to protect ourselves, casting down the arguments, the reasonings, the pretensions, the things that exalt themselves uh, against the knowledge of God. To bring thoughts, designs, plans into captivity. You know, it's human nature to want to protect ourselves. We're all born with an aversion to pain. Uh, we, we find something hurts, we want to avoid it. Well, you know, a lot of times when people learn certain things growing up, not just physical pain, but... They don't want to be hurt. They want to protect themselves. And it's amazing the, the, the reasonings, the arguments, the self-justifications. Those are things that stand in the way of repentance. And it's incredible what we can, we, we can build up in our minds. Remember, the heart is deceitful above all things. One of the primary ingredients of human nature... You and I can get away from just about any person on earth except for one. Wherever you go, you're going to take yourself with you. You know, you can, you can get away from anybody on earth except you, but wherever you go, there you are. So, we have to live with ourselves. Now, there's sort of two alternatives on, on, on the matter. You see, if we're doing things we shouldn't do, we either have to rationalize, justify, provide arguments and reasonings in our mind to protect the self, or else we're confronted with the need to repent. Honesty is absolutely necessary as a prelude to repentance. No one can repent of something that they don't see and that they won't admit. How can you repent of it if you don't see it and won't admit it? You know, it's it's incredible. You can look in the Bible and look at just different examples as well as maybe things you think of in your own life and the lives of others. Think about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It was religious men who plotted that crucifixion. Religious leaders. Men who prided themselves on obedience to the law. And yet, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the various priests and members of the Sanhedrin got together and they made a decision, we're told, to hire false witnesses. They went out and paid people to come in and bear witness against Jesus. They already had it made up that they were going to convict him. They hired false witnesses. Later on, after the resurrection, they really got in a panic, and so they bribed the soldiers. Bribed the soldiers and paid them to tell the story, spread the story, that we went to sleep and his disciples came and stole the body. Now, here were religious leaders, and yet, clearly... Violation in a very literal sense uh, of two commandments right off. Commandments to, the Ten Commandments, the Sixth Commandment says, Thou shalt not kill. Now, when you bring about the execution of an innocent person, that's thou shalt not kill, plus you hired false witnesses. You hired false witnesses. Well, the commandment says, You shall not bear false witness. The point is, those men had to justify their actions to themselves. They erected reasonings, arguments, pretensions. They came up with a rationalization in their mind that enabled them to live with themselves. Though they were in actuality directly violating the law. 
If you would ask one of those men in terms of his theology, do you believe that the law is done away? Do you believe it's necessary to keep the Ten Commandments? Oh my, they would have been highly offended that you would have ever brought the question up. The Pharisees prided themselves on their scrupulous observance of the law and how much more carefully they observed the law than other people. And yet, you see, they felt threatened. They got scared. If you want to read the story, you go back. The, the real catalyst was the resurrection of Lazarus. And some of the people went with a report of that to the Pharisees. And uh, I believe that's in John 11. And uh, the um, Pharisees got together with the priests. And they said, what are we going to do? This, this is getting out of hand. Everybody's going to believe in Him. And the Romans are going to come and take away our place and our nation. So they looked at the situation. They said, we've got a disaster in the making. We've got to do something. We've got to protect ourselves. And so they came up with a plan. It was a plan that involved direct violation of the law. And yet, in their mind, they rationalize, they excuse, they justify. You see, we're involved in a spiritual war. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical weapons, but they are mighty through God. They can pull down those strongholds, uh, those walls, those fortifications that we erect to protect ourselves. Those imaginations and arguments and reasonings, uh, those high pretensions... Those plans that are based on self-will rather than God's will. Let's notice back in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. In verse 12, the Apostle Paul said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof, Sin should not be the ruler, should not be the king in your life. Verse 13, Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now, it's interesting, you might look in your margin, you may have a marginal note, just as I do, that the word translated instruments in verse 13 literally means arms or weapons. Arms or weapons. Don't yield your members as weapons of unrighteousness unto sin. Rather, yield your members as weapons of righteousness unto God. The members of our body, our eyes, our mouth, our hands, our feet. Are we yielding them as spiritual weapons, which, which side of the battle, which side of the war are we fighting on? You know, President Bush, in talking about the terrorists, uh, said that he was not only going to make war with the terrorists, the ones who had perpetrated the act, but with those who gave them aid and comfort, those who were their allies, those who supported them. You and I are involved in a spiritual war and we have to examine the members of our body and say, which side are they on? Which side are they providing armaments for? Which side are they providing weapons for? You know, when we let our eyes look at things we shouldn't see, when we let our mouth say things we shouldn't say, we let our hands do and touch things they shouldn't, our feet take us places that they shouldn't then we're yielding the members of our body as weapons in a spiritual war, but weapons that are fighting and being utilized by the wrong side. You know, it's a pretty serious offense. You think about it from the standpoint of what's going on in our country right now. If somebody were found to be providing weapons for the, uh, for the terrorists, um, They'd be lumped right in with the terrorists. They'd be in very serious trouble. That's a serious offense to provide weapons for the enemy in time of warfare. You and I are involved in a spiritual war. Which side are we yielding our members as weapons for? Notice back in 2 Corinthians 
chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Paul talks about, in verse 3, if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to them that are lost and whom the God of this mind is blinded. The God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. You go back in, in Genesis chapter 1. We're told about in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We're told that God said, let there be light. And there was light. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Provided light in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to reveal the Father, to declare the Father. The knowledge of the glory of God, our destiny, our purpose. To ultimately be born into the very family of God. We're told God the Father, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You and I have the opportunity to ultimately enter the family of God as sons of God. Our vile bodies will become like unto His glorious body. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Revealed through Jesus Christ. Verse 7, we, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be, on, may be of God and not of us. We have this priceless treasure, this pearl of great price, as the Bible calls it. We have this priceless treasure, and we've got it in a clay pot. We've got it in an earthen vessel. The treasure is of God. We're the clay pot. And the point of this is that the glory, may, the power may be of God and not of us. There is no one who's going to arrive in the kingdom of God and be able to look around and say, you know, all these other folks need a little help, but I just sort of gritted my teeth and I just did it. Nobody's going to get there that way. God provides us with this precious knowledge, this precious calling, this Promise of glory that so transcends and goes beyond anything you and I can even fathom or imagine. The knowledge of the glory of God. The knowledge of our purpose and our destiny. And the very Holy Spirit of God, which is the earnest of that inheritance. And we've got it in an earthen vessel. In a clay pot. And the point of that is that the glory, the power, may be of God and not of us. It's not us who will be able to take pride in what we did, but the realization of what God did in and through us. Now, Paul went on to say in verse 8, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. The Apostle Paul said, you know, I've got this treasure and I've got it in an earthen vessel, but the power is of God and not of me. We're troubled on every side, surrounded by trouble, but not in distress about it. You know, you go through and you read about Paul's life. He was troubled on every side in a very literal sense. Everywhere he turned, he, there, there was trouble. You know, you think, well, he, yeah, he had some persecution from the outside. Well, yes, he did. He had, uh, uh, he had problems sometimes from the Roman government. Sometimes he had problems from the Jewish religious leaders, people that had been his close associates, his own people. Uh, he was maligned. Paul also confronted problems in the church. You go through and read the book of Acts. You read Paul's epistles. Look at how many times people were imputing false motives to Paul. You know the event that got Paul arrested and he spent... About five years in, in imprisonment. 
all stem from the fact of people in the church spreading things about him that weren't true. Go back and read it in the book of Acts. Paul came back to Jerusalem. He'd been away for quite a while, went in to meet with James. And uh, James told him, uh, you know, they, they discussed things, and James told him, he said, look, you know, there are rumors going around about you. There are things we know they're not, I know they're not true, but there are things being said about you, and people are believing it. There are all these rumors that are spreading around about you, certain things that you're teaching and disrespect for, uh, for the law. And so James came up with a plan. He said, now I'll tell you what to do. You know, we need to squelch this rumor, and I know you want to squelch it too. And so James gave him a plan. He said, we've got these fellows here going into the temple for this ceremony. You go in with them. Everybody will see you there. And that will clear the issue up. Well, it didn't, did it? You see, there are two sources of rumors. Sometimes things are... People may be sincere. They just got their facts wrong. They, they got mixed up or they got confused or they... Uh, uh, they put two and two together and got five or whatever it was. Uh, they may be sincere, but they're mixed up and confused. They've drawn the wrong conclusion, so they've got their facts wrong. That's one source. But there's another source, and that other source is when somebody's got an agenda. Now, if somebody is sincere and they just simply mixed up or got their facts wrong, uh, you can straighten that person out. That's what James was assuming that these problems, these rumors going around about Paul were motivated uh, by people who just were just had their facts wrong. They were all tangled up, and, and all you needed to do was set the facts straight. But that wasn't the source of the problem. There were people who had an agenda. And so when Paul went into the temple, they just changed the rumor. Now, instead of saying, well, Paul doesn't have anything to do with the temple, he, he doesn't believe in that, uh, now they said, he brought Gentiles in. He defiled the temple. That's why he came in here. And you remember the story. Paul got arrested, uh, spent a couple of years in Caesarea, uh, wound up uh, uh, in transit, finally in Rome for a couple of years, went through this long, drawn-out period of imprisonment. You read his epistles, and you read how often there were people who were saying things about him. You don't have to take my word for it. Just go through. Read First and Second Corinthians. Read some of the books that Paul himself wrote and the, and the things he had to confront. You think, well, who in the world would say anything bad about the Apostle Paul? Well... Just go through and read the book, and you'll find out a number of people did. Paul said, we're troubled on every side. He knew what he was saying when he said that. He said, i got people on the inside, i got people on the outside. Uh, we're troubled on every side. Troubled on every side, but not distressed. Troubled. Troubled, surrounded by trouble, but not distressed. We're perplexed. You know, you can be... I don't, I don't understand this. This doesn't make sense. Poor Job was perplexed. He couldn't make sense of why all this stuff was happening to him. Paul says, we're perplexed, but not in despair. I may not understand it, but God does. That's the difference between being perplexed and being in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. People may persecute us, but God hasn't forsaken us. Cast down, but not destroyed. You see, Paul understood that... Uh, uh, verse 11, we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Paul said, I was called to follow Christ, and, and I'm going to follow Him regardless of what I have to go through. On down chapter 6, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul says, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Well, people can receive God's grace in vain. God takes the initiative in our lives, but you and I must respond to God's initiative. We must respond to God's grace. Paul went on in 
verse 4, he says, But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Everything imaginable, Paul went through. He said, in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God. And then he lists all these things. You know, the ups and the downs, the, uh, the good things, the bad things. How did he do it? How did he go through this? He says, by the armor by, in verse 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God, and by the armor of righteousness. On the right hand and on the left. That was the way Paul went through it. Paul knew that he was involved in a warfare. He was beset on every side. There were ups and downs in his life. How did he handle that? By the word of truth, the power of God, and the armor of righteousness. Now, what is that armor of righteousness? Well, let's go on over a few pages to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Familiar set of scriptures. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You remember Paul said in Second Corinthians 6 about taking the armor of God uh, in the right hand and in the left? You know, the two primary things that they that they had out on the battlefield was the shield in their left hand and the sword in their right hand, taking the armor of God on the right hand and the left, the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Paul understood that he was in a spiritual war. And you can't fight a spiritual war with physical weapons. You can't fight it with, with human tactics and human strategies. Paul understood that. He went through all sorts of things. But you see, Paul had a perspective on it. He told Timothy, he said, war a good warfare, fight a good fight, fight the good fight of faith. Paul knew what he was talking about because he himself went through that through his life. How would you like to match up war stories with the Apostle Paul in the kingdom of God? Tell him, oh, I, you know, I really, I really had it rough. Let me tell you about some of my trials. I think I'd be embarrassed. I would be so humbled and overwhelmed at, at meeting someone like Paul when I think of all that he went through and, and the little bit that I've gone through isn't, you know, isn't a peanut by comparison. I think most of us have to realize that. It wasn't just that Paul went through one big trial in his life and it was all over with. Paul went through, he, he talked about it. Trouble on every side, but not, you see, didn't give up, didn't, not, not, uh, uh, not in despair. He was perplexed at times, couldn't understand, but he wasn't distressed, he wasn't in despair about it, he didn't, because he understood the power of God. You see, we're told, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. 
If you're fighting a spiritual war, then you need strength and power that comes from a source outside yourself. It is only that source outside yourself that can tear down the strongholds, the fortifications we build up in our own lives to sort of protect and insulate ourselves. Tear down the arguments, the reasonings, the, the, uh, uh, the things that stand in the way of self-honesty and repentance. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Don't try to fight a spiritual war, a spiritual battle, on your own strength, because your strength will fail. Peter had to learn that lesson the hard way on the night that Jesus was arrested. You know, you remember the story, how Christ had told Peter earlier in the evening, he said, Peter, you know, Satan really wants you and I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. And he was talking about what was going to happen to him and how he was going to be taken and arrested. And he knew that all of his friends were going to flee from him. They were going to get scared and cut out of there. And Peter immediately, indignantly, uh, flared up and he said, Lord, I'll never do that. I'd never leave you. I'd die first. Jesus looked at him and he said, Peter, the rooster is not going to crow tomorrow morning before you have already denied me three different times. Peter was absolutely indignant, knew he'd never do such a thing. Well, they went on out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus told them to pray. took Peter, James, and John with him a little further, and he told them, he said, I want you to watch and pray with me for an hour. And he went on beyond and fell down on his face and really besought God. Came back and found them. They were asleep. Woke him up and said, can't you pray for an hour? Went and prayed again and came back and here they were asleep again. You remember, came back three different times. They did a whole lot more sleeping than praying that night. The third time Jesus came back and woke him up and he said, okay, come on, let's go. Well, they came and the soldiers came and everybody grabbed around. There was this big uh, confused melee. Now, Jesus had... had Sort of set the stage for it a little earlier. When just as they got ready to leave the upper room coming out of Jerusalem, uh, he just asked a question. He said, uh, anybody uh, got a weapon with them? Anybody got a sword? Peter immediately, oh, yes, absolutely. Got, you know, old Betsy right here by my side. Got her with me. Jesus must have sort of smiled and said, good. You're going to learn a lesson tonight, Peter. You see, Peter got in a crisis Peter hadn't spent preparation time in praying. Uh, he was tired and he dozed off. He found himself in a crisis and the first thing he thought of was he drew the sword and he was ready to go after the guy. And he whacked across there and the fellow dodged and managed to cut his ear off. Can you imagine, you know, all of a sudden here's a, this poor guy's ear down there in the dust and, and his blood is pouring down the side of his head. And Jesus simply calmly reaches down, picks up the ear, puts it back on. The pain stops. The blood stops. Can you imagine what must have people's eyes, you know, here, the, the guy himself? What, a, what an incredible thing. And then he looked at Peter and he said, put that thing up. Don't you know that he that lives by the sword is going to die by the sword? Don't you realize that even right now I could call to my Father and He would send twelve legions of angels? Ooh, Peter never thought of that. You know, Peter, I'm not defenseless. I've got weapons that you don't even know anything about. I could call on my Father right now. He'd send twelve legions of angels and I dare say one angel would have been enough. But you talk about having them surrounded, 12 legions would have pretty well done the trick. Peter was frightened. You know, the trouble is, see, if you rely on physical weapons, if you rely on a sword sooner or later, you're going to meet somebody's got a bigger sword, somebody's a little faster, or maybe you're going to meet a whole bunch of somebody's at the same time. They'll have you out, outnumbered, outgunned. If you rely on physical things, 
you're going to find yourself in a crisis. Peter had a lesson to learn that night because you go on through the book of Acts and you find Peter never made that mistake again. Peter learned how to rely on the power of God. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You know, Peter was a big, strong, tough guy. He was a, he was a fisherman. Now, you know, back in those days, they didn't have electric hoists to haul the catch in. Uh, if you've got a net full of fish, uh, you just tugged and pulled until you managed to do with it what, whatever you're doing. You work out like that from the time you were a kid, you know, on up through teenage and young adulthood. Peter's probably somewhere about 30 years of age in the prime of life. He had worked out on the, on the water and worked in these big boats and hauled in fishing nets for years. He was strong. He was tough. You know, his hands were, were hardened and toughened with, with hard work. And he'd pulled on the big oars and he'd hauled in the fishing nets. And he was a confident fellow. He was always the guy to step out in front. He had a very important lesson to learn because if he was going to successfully be used of God as a leader in the New Testament church, he could not fight his battles using physical weapons or relying on his own human strength. Paul said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Don't rely on yourself. Don't rely on your strength. Rely on God's strength. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to, with, to stand against the wiles of the devil. A successful campaign can be waged in the spiritual realm only as worldly weapons are abandoned and total reliance is placed on the spiritual weaponry. A spiritual war can only be successfully fought with spiritual weapons. The Apostle Paul talked about the armor of God. And he said, take the whole armor of God. Because without the whole armor of God, you have areas of vulnerability. Now it's interesting, part of Ephesians 6, Paul is actually paraphrasing from back in Isaiah 59, talking about Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 59... Isaiah writes in verse 16, speaking of God, He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Now, technically, a cloak was not part of the armor. But in addition to the armor that was worn, a person would often wear a cloak. Soldiers would often wear a cloak as they went on out. You know, you weather's cold or wet or something. Jesus put on zeal for a cloak. So in addition to the armor that we put on. It's a good idea to follow his example and put on zeal for a cloak. Now, let's consider what is our warfare directed against. We're told that we're to war a good warfare. We're to fight a good fight of faith. Paul fought a good fight. We're, we learn that, uh, uh, you know, all these this emphasis on spiritual warfare... What is it exactly that we're fighting? Well, first and foremost, our warfare, our spiritual warfare, is against Satan the devil. See, Paul emphasizes in Ephesians 6, 11, and 12 that the reason we put on the whole armor of God is that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. People are not the problem. We sometimes think they are. 
But Paul said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's not the problem. Against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness or wicked spirits as it could be translated. Satan the devil. He's the one. We're, we're told back in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Here in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul is addressing a situation of an individual who had... Uh, been bogged down in some ongoing sins and Paul had taken corrective action and had imposed church discipline upon him to uh, wake him up and shake him up. This individual had come to genuine repentance and so Paul uh, talked about the fact in verse 8 that they, I beseech you, you should confirm your love toward him. Why? Well, he had mentioned in verse 7 uh, that lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up in overmuch sorrow. You know, it's possible to go beyond uh, true repentance to a point of, of um, being so discouraged, so depressed, so down that uh, uh, that's a problem. And, and that talked about that in, in verse 11. The purpose is lest. Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. Satan has devices. He has strategies, tactics. We don't want Satan to get an advantage of us. We're not ignorant of his devices. We're in a war against Satan. And he's out to take advantage of any uh, tactic, any weakness. You know, a good, uh, uh, a good general becomes aware of the weaknesses of his foe. And he exploits those weaknesses. And uh, uh, Satan seeks to take advantage of us. We're not ignorant of his devices. One of his devices is this matter here of, of discouragement, depression, person just becoming overwhelmed with, with a sense of, of inadequacy, unworthiness, of just becoming swallowed up in overmuch sorrow. So Satan is there to take advantage of that, to sort of compound the problem. You know, with other people, it may be pride and cockiness, arrogance. With others, it may be other things. There are many different weak spots and different people, different personalities encounter different things. But Satan is there. You know the famous story. People can go through trouble and they can draw the wrong conclusions and still make themselves vulnerable to the very thing they were trying to avoid. You know, the French, after being... Uh, uh, facing German invasion back at the time of World War I. After the war, they said, you know, we're going to protect ourselves. We're going to ensure the Germans never come roaring in here again. There was a famous French general. His name was General Maginot. And he came up with a surefire strategy. We're going to fortify the border. We're going to put the biggest guns we can get here on the border. We're going to cement those things in. We're going to aim them toward the Germans. Boy, they'll never come charging through here again. They didn't. They just went up and around through Belgium, came around on the back side. You couldn't even turn the guns around because they were cemented in the ground. Oops. <laughs> you know, right concern, wrong lesson. It's a wrong lesson. Satan is very clever to exploit our weaknesses. You know, any of you ever, uh, if you ever saw the movie Patton, one of the memorable scenes in the movie, uh, and as far as I know from what I've read, it was based on real life. Uh, Patton, uh, of course, was in this uh, tank battle with General Rommel uh, there in North Africa. And he outmaneuvered Rommel. And, uh, uh, you know, his plan just worked. And he was really elated and as he's standing here on this bluff overlooking the, the battle site, uh, he looks down, you know, sort of waves his fist at Rommel, and he says, I read your book. See, Rommel had written a book on strategy, on tank warfare. <laughs> Patton read the book. So he had a pretty good idea what Rommel was going to do. He said, I read your book. The point is, brethren, Satan... Satan probably knows us better than 
We know ourselves. He's sort of read our books sometimes. He's looked at our lives. If he wants to get at us. He has strategies. He has tactics. You and I are fighting a battle, first and foremost, against Satan the devil. That's why we're told, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Take to you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. You may be able to stand to resist the wiles of the devil. Because he's wily. He's clever. We're fighting a battle against Satan the devil. But that's not the only battle. That's not the only war you and I are fighting. We're fighting a war against Satan. Our spiritual war. Satan is the enemy. But there's another enemy. Paul addresses it in Romans 7. Romans 7. Uh, pick it up in verse 22. Paul says in Romans 7, 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Well, the answer is the next verse. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Paul said, you know, with my mind, I've made, up my, I've made up my mind. I've made my choice. I know what I want to do. And so, by choice and by conscious decision, I delight in the law of God, and that's what I want. But the members of my body are not always cooperative with that. You see, the pulls of the flesh war against the mind. I've made choices in my mind to yield to the law of God, but there's something, there's a warfare going on. And the flesh pulls me towards sin. The mind has made a decision to reject sin and to choose God, but the flesh, the pulls of the flesh, the physical appetites pull me in the wrong direction. So there's conflict. He said, there's a warfare going on. Who shall deliver me? How am I going to win this warfare? Through, I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how we'll win. Through Christ. We're in a war that fights the, the struggle in terms of our human flesh. The pulls of the flesh. We're warring against Satan the devil. We're also warring against the pulls of our human flesh. There are many other places in Scripture you can go to talk about this. Let's notice one other aspect of our warfare. We're also in a war against the world. Struggling against Satan, against the pulls of the flesh, and against this world. James said, if you're the friend of the world, you're the enemy of God. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. The... Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 2, love not the world. You know, don't be in love with this world, with this society. Back in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. In verse 5 he says, Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You see, verse 4 tells us that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What's the victory that overcomes the world? Our faith. You can't overcome the world unless you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, understand what he means by that, because the Protestants will take and misapply that verse. But let's go back to Romans 10 and let me show you the kind of belief that, that is being discussed. Romans 10.9 says that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. The kind of faith that enables us to overcome, enables us to win a spiritual battle, a spiritual war, 
is the kind of faith that is not just a superficial belief. It's belief from the heart. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. When you really believe in your heart, it will change your life. If you really believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead, you really believe that, that He walked out of that tomb, that He put on once again the glory with which He had shared with the Father from eternity. Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, is at the right hand of the Father, and He's going to return to this earth in power and glory. If you really believe that in your heart, it will change your life. Because your actions and your behavior will flow from that belief. Our core beliefs, what is most real to us, determines our feelings, our thoughts, our actions. It flows from what we believe. We're not talking about just the kind of belief, you know, James said, you believe there's one God, you do well. The demons also believe in trouble. Yeah, they're scared. They, they know God. They know that God exists. We're talking about something that is belief from the heart. From the innermost part of your being. You really believe Jesus Christ. You believe the message that He brought. You believe Him. You believe that He is the Son of God. That He did rise from the dead and He's going to come back. That will change and transform your life. It's by that kind of faith that you and I are enabled to overcome. We're fighting a war against the world. And we can only overcome the world through faith. God and the things of God have to be more real to us than this world is. Jesus said in John 16, He told His disciples, He said, you know, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I've conquered. I've conquered. So we have a warfare that is being waged against Satan, against our flesh, against this world. And our warfare is to be carried on under the banner of our captain, of our leader, Jesus Christ. He's called in Hebrews 2 and verse 10, the captain of our salvation. The captain of our salvation. You know, in, in, in the army, you have to follow the leader. You have to follow the one that is the captain, that is the leader we go forward, as it describes in Psalm 60, under the banner. Psalm 60 and verse 4. It says, You have given a banner to them that fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth. You've given a banner. You've given a flag. The captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ, the banner of God. It's His banner that we follow. It's displayed because of the truth. You and I go to battle. We go into this spiritual warfare following the captain of our salvation under His banner. Now, let me show you in closing seven things that you must, we must carry on this warfare with. Seven things that are necessary if we're to pursue our warfare all the way through to the victory, if, where we will be able to say, as Paul did, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. 1 Corinthians 16.13 First Corinthians 16.13 says, Watch you, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. Stand fast in the faith. Stand firm, be steadfast. In the faith. Peter makes a similar comment in 1 Peter chapter 5. Talks about Satan the devil, our enemy. 1 Peter 5. And in verse 9, we're told whom, speaking of Satan, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Steadfast in the faith. Being firm in the faith. Steadfast in the faith. Stand fast. You know, to be steadfast is 
essential, very important aspect of, of warfare. One of the most uh, uh, well-known and, and uh, traditional uh, heroes of the South uh, was General Stonewall Jackson. Now, you know, if you were to mention the name, mention him by, by his real name, uh, mention Thomas Jackson or General Thomas Jackson, most people would give you sort of a blank stare. They wouldn't know who you're talking about. But he was characterized by a nickname. goes back to the very first battle of the American War between the states. You know, the troops were untried. They were raw. Uh, they were out there in the heat of battle, the Battle of Manassas Junction. Very interesting name, by the way. Uh, they were engaged in a battle, and the, the ebb and flow was taking it back and forth, you know, the smoke and the, and the gunfire and all of the, the things, and people were scared, and, and, and here were men, most of whom were in battle for the very first time in their lives. And as the southern lines were beginning to crumble, one of the southern generals trying to rally his troops looked over, and there was one section of the southern line that was absolutely standing firm. And General Bernard B. He pointed over there to his men, and he says, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. You know, rally to him. One part of the line that didn't budge. And it so inspired and encouraged the rest that the battle tide turned the other way, and the, and, and the South won that particular battle. And Stonewall Jackson went down in history, known to friends and foe alike, as Stonewall. He earned a nickname that day that, that characterized a trait that he had. And it's a trait that any successful warrior has to have because you can't turn tail and run and be very successful in battle. You can't win a spiritual war by not being steadfast in the faith. Having that quality of being steadfast, of standing like a stone wall, as it were. Steadfast in the faith. Our battle, our war has to be carried on with steadfastness. Notice Jude chapter, uh, or verse 3, only one chapter in Jude. Verse 3. Jude writes, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Earnestly contend. Earnestly strive for. To contend is to fight, to strive for. Earnestly contend. You can't just half-heartedly do it. You've got to put your all into it to earnestly contend. Notice back uh, uh, here in, in 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16. We looked at it a moment ago, but we'll look at, at another aspect. First Corinthians 16. And uh, verse 13, it says, Watch you. Watch you. Peter addressed it in 1 Peter 5, 8, where he made a, a very similar uh statement as he described again this this quality of being vigilant watch you Peter said um, in, in verse 8 that we need to be sober and be vigilant be vigilant you know an army doesn't get along very far if, if people are going to sleep on the job they're not watching many battles have turned on the fact that somebody wasn't paying attention and the opposing troops came up. They caught them from the blind side. They, they came up in a direction that, that they didn't think anyone could approach from. You know, in the, in the battle that uh, David was uh, fighting for the capture of Jerusalem, the Jebusites were convinced that nobody could get up over the wall. David and his nephew Joab, who was his chief military man, started talking about it, and David said, you know, there's a way to get in there that nobody would even notice. If we could figure a way to get up through the water shaft, 
climb up through the gutter, you could come up on the inside and open the gate. Because they're not going to be watching. They don't think anybody can do that. They're sort of looking over the wall and seeing the troops down there. Joab did that. Very remarkable feat. He became general of all the armies of, of Israel in, in, in sort of in consequence of that. The point is, vigilance is necessary. If you're not vigilant, you get blindsided. You know, you vigilance is important because if you're in, in a war, it's not where you're watching that you're likely to be overrun nearly so much as it is the spot that you didn't think you needed to watch. Vigilance is, in, is crucial. Uh, also, right here, uh, as it says in, in uh, 1 Peter, and also says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6, uh, it says, uh, uh, we're told, let us watch and be sober. Sobriety is pretty important. You know, one of the great battles of the American Revolution turned on sobriety. Uh, General Washington crossed the Delaware, surprised the British, and defeated the troops on the 25th of December. You see, the British had hired all these mercenary troops. Uh, they had paid the Grand Duke of Hesse and hired all these Hessians uh, to come over here and fight the battle, fight the war. Well, the Hessians were, it was the 25th of December, and they were celebrating the day in the manner in which it was originally intended. They got drunk. And they were, some of them were passed out, and others were so intoxicated they didn't know which end was up. You know, it's interesting, 25th of December was not even a holiday in many of the American colonies at that time. General Washington crossed the Delaware on the 25th of December, and sure enough, the Hessians weren't sober. And drunk troops don't put up a real good fight. It takes sobriety. That's why the fruit of temperance is so emphasized in Scripture. You know, if you're not uh, temperate, if you if you if you lose your if you lose your sobriety, uh, then the very part of your mind that God's Spirit works with uh, is really not very responsive to the Spirit. It's under the influence of, of something else. Let's look here, Second Timothy two. Let's notice a a fifth characteristic. Second Second Timothy two. And we'll notice in verse 3, You therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardness. You know, soldiers don't have an easy time of it. These fellows that went over to Afghanistan, uh, they didn't have just an easy, convenient time, you know, and, and make sure that they were always comfortable and they get to take their Sealy Posturepedic with them. Uh, no, you know, here are guys that are camping out there in harsh conditions, and uh, they're marching and sometimes uh, uh, doing double time, trying to hurry and get one place ahead of the enemy. Uh, they're... Uh, in every aspect, you, you, you study warfare and you realize that soldiers... If they're going to be successful, have to endure hardness. You can't just be in it for the good times. So, oh, I didn't know it was going to get tough. I didn't know it was going to get cold. Oh, well, we better go home. Oh, I didn't know I was going to have to sleep on the ground. Oh, you, I got to eat this. Oh, that doesn't look like what Mama used to make. I think I'm gonna, you know, I'd like to go back home, get some home cooking. I don't want to eat this stuff. He told him, he says, you've got to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Should you and I, as soldiers of Christ, have a lower threshold for hardness than the soldiers of this world? You look at what some of these soldiers uh, have gone through and the hardness that they had to endure. Paul told Timothy, see, Paul knew what he was talking about, and he told Timothy, he said, but Timothy, you know, things may get pretty rough. But that's okay. Endure hardness. That's what you have to do as a soldier, endurance. Now let's notice here one other quality mentioned back in Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse 1. It says, The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemy and my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell, though a host should encamp against me. My heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me. 
In this will I be confident. It takes confidence to go out and win the battle. When you lose confidence, well, you're in trouble. You know, you'd be like some of the soldiers talked about back in the Old Testament. You remember Israel went to, uh, they marched around Jericho and the priest blew the trumpet and the walls came down. And they came away from there thinking what great warriors they were. Not exactly the right conclusion to draw from that battle. So they went charging off on their own up to Ai. And the people at Ai did something sort of sneaky. They came out to battle. They came out of the they came out of the walls and came charging out at the Israelites, uh, slaughtered a few of them, and were told that the heart of the people melted like water. Boy, it just like an old dog with his tail tucked between his legs. They they just you know all the fight went out of them. They lost confidence. You can't endure. Now, David writes this. Where did David's confidence come from? He was chased to and fro with Saul, by Saul. He went through all sorts of difficulties. David faced many problems and many difficulties. Why didn't he lose confidence? Because he said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I don't have anybody to be afraid of. Because the Lord is my light. He's my salvation. I'm going to be confident. doesn't matter if I'm surrounded by the enemy. My heart shall not fear. The Lord should rise against me, and this will I be confident. Confidence. His confidence rested on God. Now notice on over in Psalm 35. Let's notice our final characteristic. Final thing necessary. Carry on successful war. Psalm 35, verse 1, he says, Plead my cause, O Lord. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive against me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold and shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am your salvation. Plead my cause, O Lord. David prayed to God. He besought God to fight his battle, to take care of it. You see, warfare, successful warfare, has to be carried on with steadfastness, Standing firm has to be carried on with earnestness, with watchfulness, with sobriety, with endurance, with confidence, and with prayer. That the battle that we're fighting is being fought against the devil, against the flesh, and against the world. It has it's a spiritual war and it has to be fought with spiritual weapons. It has to be carried on with these problems. Now let's conclude back in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul wrote that uh, verse 14 Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light, affli our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. Our life is finished, which is but for a moment. From God's perspective, whatever trial, whatever test, whatever difficulty, whatever adversity, Paul, all the things that he went through, he said, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is temporary, transitory, it's but for a moment. It works for us. It's producing in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. How do you handle that? How do you keep that perspective? Well, by not putting our attention and our focus on the things you can see, the things that you can see and touch and taste and feel, the things that are sensed by the physical senses, but at the things which are not see. Because the things that you can see are temporary. They will pass from the sun. 
But the thing you and I can't see with our physical eyes, but can only see by faith, those things are eternal. They endure 